So I'm Bill Kennedy, and it's now go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of Go Time. It's episode number six. Uh, I'm Eric St. Martin. Today, here with me, we have Brian Kettleson. Say hello, Brian. Hello. And we have Carlicia Campos. Say hello. Glad to be here. Hi, everybody. And we have a special guest with us today, um, Bill Kennedy from Arden Labs and Go Bridge is here with us today. You might also know him from all of his workshops that he does, like the world now, right, Bill? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to get into uh, Europe a couple of times this year. Yeah, this is, uh, it, it's crazy. It's like every, every day we see you somewhere else. I, I don't know how the planes arrive in time for your workshops. <laughs> <laughs> Scheduling is difficult sometimes, for sure. Um, I mean, what's your mileage look like for frequent flyer miles? I think I'm at like 130,000 miles right now. Jeez. I don't envy you. Diamond Elite. Yeah. I'm uh, on American. I am now platinum on my way to executive platinum. Nice. But yes, these are not goals that you should, you should want to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have your favorite uh, soap? And shampoo that comes in a small bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I leverage whatever the hotel has to the extent that I can. Uh, so today we're going to be talking with Bill about mechanical sympathy. So I think this is going to be a really interesting topic. Um, before we get into that, let's, uh, let's talk news and interesting projects. Anybody have anything interesting they want to talk about before we get into it with Bill? You know, it was a pretty quiet week in, in Go News from my perspective, but I did find two relatively interesting projects. The first one I thought might be a winner in the Best Hack of the Year Award. Um, in the show notes, you'll find a link to the blog post from Axin, A-C-K-S-I-N dot com, where they hacked together a way to send StatsD type metrics to Google Analytics, which seems like an interesting shoehorn. And it, it looks like it works pretty well. So you get a nice uh, free stats D monitoring for your servers uh, using Google Analytics inappropriately. I approve completely of this plan. You know, but the interesting thing about that, though, is you can see it alongside um, metrics that you're already collecting in Google, Google Analytics and how some of those things might impact um, your funnel. So I can't think of any specific uses I'd use it for off the bat, but it does I think it has potential to be valuable. It was interesting to say the least. I'm not sure I would put it in production on a useful system. What if Google decided that they could figure out that traffic and start tossing it? Yeah, I think I prefer Grafana or something like that, but. Datadog all the way. Datadog is good stuff too. So the second interesting project I found is, is one in the multitude of vendoring projects. This one's called Manual, M-A-N-U-L. And you'll find the link to that in the show notes. And uh, it's, it's another one that does vendoring uh, with Git submodules this time. And it looked to be one of the better um, vendoring packages that, that supports Git submodules. So it had some, had some very nice uh, commands and utilities with it. I'm interested to see, though, how they solve some of the drawbacks from using submodules. Because um, a lot of people have reservations about using Git submodules. There's kind of some... Um, inherent flaws with the way it works. Like, number one would be that um, you're still reliant on that repository to exist in the future. So if it went down or somebody decided to delete their project, because that totally never happens. <laughs> or even just um, rename it. You still wouldn't have access to the code, but some of it also comes in the way um, submodules work. So if I pull down your project, and I, I need to do a Git submodule update to update my local versions of those submodules. But if I don't do that, I'm still running with my um, prior versions of those submodules. So, but by checking out your code, it doesn't move my submodules with it. So I can accidentally commit my older versions of your stuff, and those lines are really some like really easy to miss. 
Um, and there's a couple issues too with, with the way those things are kind of merged and stuff too. So I'm interested to see how that's solved because people step on each other's sub modules all the time. You see it where, you know, I pull down your changes, but I didn't notice you had sub module updates, but then I commit my commit and my sub module uh, versions are different than yours. And I just kind of step on yours. Um, but I mean, these are problems that people were having years ago. So maybe there's some stuff in Git now that accounts for it. Maybe the tool accounts for it a little bit too. Um, I guess if you did it on like a commit hook or something, you could probably, but yeah, it, it's interesting though. Um, sub modules can be valuable and they can also be a pain, but I guess everything in programming can be right. Always. Have you guys used sub modules before? Anybody? Mm, I have, I have, I did not run into any problem with it. Didn't do anything crazy, just drop a sub-module there to access it. Yeah, I'll find a link surrounding some of those um, pitfalls, uh, and we'll drop it in the show notes before this is released. I, this has been a couple of years, so I, I can't remember the name of one off the top of my head, but I know people were having a lot of uh, weird issues. So anything else we want to talk about? That's all I had. I don't have anything. I know what we do want to talk about. Mechanical, Mechanical sympathy? sympathy? Exactly. Yes. First things, first thing, where did this name come from? We were talking about this earlier, but I want to hear from the horse mouth. It didn't come from me. I mean, this is a term <laughs> that um, I think I got from um, Martin Thompson, who if you watch any of his videos. He says he got it from a race car driver. Yeah, Jackie um, Stewart was a, a Formula One driver. And I think during an interview, he had said something along the lines of, you know, you don't need to be an engineer or a mechanic or something to be a race car driver, but you need to have mechanical sympathy. And basically, he was just implying by having some level of understanding of how the machine, the, the, the car worked, that it made you a better driver. And I think as Bill kind of pointed out, uh, Martin Thompson, I think it was, um, started applying that to programming. So Bill, would you like to fill us in a, a bit on how how you think that that concept applies to programming? Yeah, I mean, I only have a perspective on it from the Go side, and it's something I really focus on in the training. I, I kind of focus on two things in the training, data-oriented design and mechanical sympathy, and, and try to show how the language Go itself is very in tune around these two ideas. Um, and, I, and I really, really believe um, that if you don't understand the data that you're working with, you do not understand the problem that you're trying to solve. It all starts there. Like everything, every problem that we're trying to solve is really a data manipulation problem in some fashion, in some, in some way. So it all really starts with the data. And it's this idea that if you don't understand the data you're working with, you don't understand the problem. And if you don't understand the cost of solving that problem, you can't really reason about solving it. And to be able to reason about the cost, you have to have some understanding of what every line of code is doing and, and how that's affecting the operating system and the hardware, which is there to execute those instructions that, that you're spending time writing to begin with. So I, I think it's, it's that relationship that I'm really interested in and, and think about in terms of what Go is doing to help us. So when you talk about mechanical sympathy, you're talking about things at the physical level, like the disks, the caches, the CPU, electrical things, um, how much of that as a programmer do we have to care about? I really focus it around the data that you're working with. And so, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that the hardware that we're working today, our processors, you know, they're now multi-core processors and every core has their own sets of local caches that l1 and l2 cache in many cases belong to each core cores could then share an l3 cache and you just don't have access anymore directly to main memory so if you're writing code where the hardware cannot predict access to the data you're working with then you're going to have these cache misses that can cost you hundreds of clock cycles. And in one architecture that Scott Myers uses in one of his talks, it's 107 clock cycles every time you have a cache miss. And now that's going to change from hardware to hardware. But if you can imagine employing some sort of link, linked list data structure, where 
on every iteration, you're accessing a different node in the list. And every node in that list is not sympathetic with the caching system, doesn't exist on, their, on the same cache lines. I mean, you could be chugging through memory without even realizing it, without even understanding why it's as slow as, as it is. So, so from, let's, let's back yeah. up here just a, a second, too, because um, a lot of people come from dynamic languages, you know, Ruby, Python. Um, and even Go abstracts these concepts from you. Um, let's let's take a second and talk about CPU caches and and what those are, because I, I would argue that probably a lot of people aren't even familiar with what a CPU cache is. So we've got to talk about this at a very high representative right, right. level, because hardware is really different. But in essence, if we're dealing with a piece of hardware that has caches, then then from our perspective, it it, it can be all the same. And so the idea is that that hardware needs to have the memory that we're working with as close to it as possible. And what's going to happen today is if you need any, even a byte of memory that's sitting out in main, it's got to move from main memory into, into let's say, the L1 or L2 cache for it to be used. And these caches get pulled in and out on cache lines. And the default cache line today we we'll probably work when there's a 64 byte cache line. And so the idea is that we, the, the idea now is if you have instructions that are working with data, which is what we do, right? I mean, this is what we do all day. We're reading memory, we're writing to memory. This memory has to now get into the caching system in order for us to be able to use it. Um, this data is going to be moving on these 64 byte cache lines from main and back in. And so one of the things that we can do to be sympathetic with the hardware is try to work with data in as contiguous blocks as possible. The more contiguous our data is, you usually then at that point are probably iterating over that data. And iterating over data can create what are called you know, predictable access patterns to that data that the hardware today can pick up on. And so if we really want to give the hardware its best opportunity to take advantage of everything that's in there. We've got to be sympathetic with it. We've got to try to look at data in a way of what are our working sets of data? Can we lay data out contiguously, work with data contiguously, and can we create predictable access patterns around that? So the hardware can pick up on what, what are the next cache lines that are probably in play or will definitely be in play and pull those into the caches before those ins next instructions need them. How does somebody learn about what predictable access uh, patterns look like? And what can they do to achieve that? From today's perspective, it is the array that is really the most important data structure from the hardware perspective, because it is the array that allows you to create contiguous blocks of memory. Well, I guess structs are aligned that way too, right? Say it again. I'm sorry. Structs are also aligned contiguously. They are, but but if I was going to create a user struct and I was going to create a hundred thousand of those, and I didn't lay that out contiguous, I lay you know I created a just a linked list of these particular user values, and they laid out all over in memory almost randomly. And you started walking down that linked list. The hardware is not going to be able to pick up on any any pattern there, and you're basically going to be chugging through memory because every every access is going to be a, a cache miss so we're trying to we're trying to eliminate that by trying to keep all of the data that we can as close together as possible and the least number of cache lines as possible right because over the years processors even though they haven't got significantly faster they've become much better at multitasking so while the processor may be you know performing a math calculation at the same, in the same cycle, it can be pulling, you know, making the next stride and pulling the next cache line in uh, so that the next iteration, the data is already there and it's basically for free. If it can predict what that next cache line is, then it absolutely can do that. But if we're not being sympathetic and helping it be able to predict these things, then it can't pull that cache line until it knows exactly now this is where the data is that I need. Yeah. And, and I, it's, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so the access patterns, how you talk about it being important, thinking about the data and how you're working with it. Uh, I guess the, the two main points I can think of is basically temporal 
and spatial locality, right? Working with things that are um, located next to each other in memory or working on um, the same pieces of data at the same time, right? Kind of to your point where you can minimize the number of cache misses. Yeah, and hopefully, even if, I mean, you're not going to avoid cache misses altogether, but if you have a, a, a working set of data that you're going to be doing a lot of processing on, you know, once it gets pulled in, now it's there, you can leverage it. It's, you know, if you're bouncing around memory all the time and it's somewhat random, you're, you're just going to chug through it. So let's give an idea of bouncing around memory. A link, a link list to me could be a scenario where, right, you have a node of data, that node of data points to another node of data, and that node of data points to another node of data. And depending on how and when that data was created, that could be almost anywhere right, in the heap, depending on how that's, how that's getting created and when and how it's getting hooked up. So you right. can't guarantee in that case that every single node is on the same cache line or even in cache lines that are next to each other. And I guess another example would be like a multidimensional array, right, iterating over row-based versus column-based. Yeah, yeah. We actually have some examples in the training with that over benchmarking where you actually see a significant difference in performance um, if you go row based, you see it's much faster than if you go in column based, kind of breaking, breaking the, the, you know, going against the grain. Yeah. So it's interesting though, right? Because we, we typically think about memory for free, right? You know, we're like, oh yeah, it's, it's in RAM. RAM's fast. At least I don't have to go to disk for it. Right. But doing something like column first or row first uh, iteration over uh, like an array like that, I, I mean, it really demonstrates the point how much, how much slower it is to go to RAM than CPU cache. And it, it really shows its head, you know, the bigger that grows. And there's other things too, um, uh, even just cause we use typical operating systems have the, uh, I always mess up this name, the transaction look aside buffer, I think is what it's called, where basically it maps the address from memory your program has to the real memory, physical memory address. And that has pages too that you can blow out and it kind of has to load back in and that's expensive, right? So every time you blow that out because you're, you're not working with uh, memory that's located next to each other. You know, my interest in this actually started to develop when I came into Go because from that, before that I was in C Sharp and we had lists and we had queues and we had stacks, we had data structures, right? And even C++ gave us all these data structures. And when I came into Go, I was like, where are all my data structures? Like, I don't understand this. So I, I just see an array. I see a slice, which I honestly didn't understand at the time. And I see maps. And it's really silly because I didn't really understand what slices were. I just thought they were really just arrays. And back in school, we were really taught that, you know, arrays are difficult to work with. And I actually avoided slices for the first couple of months working in Go using linked lists because I, I, I honestly didn't understand why we didn't have data structures. And eventually at some point I realized that everybody's using slices and the language is pushing you towards slices. And I figured out I had to really learn what this is. And now when you step back and you look at it from this point of view, I mean, the, the underlying data structure for the slice is an array, right? The slice is the most important data structure in Go. And as I peel this onion every month about more and more about Go, all I keep seeing is how Go is pushing us towards writing sympathetic code goes pushing us towards doing the right things without anybody realizing it go wants us to work with these slices because then we're really working with arrays and contiguous memory and it's giving us our best opportunity to have these sympathies without even realizing that we're being sympathetic with the hardware so go to me is just an incredibly fascinating language when it comes to that and other areas of the language too where you see that you're really being sympathetic or like the operating system scheduler on the concurrency side without even realizing it, right? Just these idioms and these things that we tell people to do all the time, they're, they're, they're based not on just, hey, we want you to do this. They're based on real things around performance, simplicity, readability, th those types of things. It all kind of comes full circle. Yeah, I think there's a lot of programming idioms that can be followed to help. But I, I think you're right. I guess I had never really considered some of the uh, language functionality that um, it's abstracting away these uh, these things and making our programs more sympathetic by default, right? Channels are a good example too, right? You know, you're 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 passing pieces of data over between threads so that 
um, the data can stay locally on the cache for that particular thread. But what about the reference types, your slice, your maps, your channel values, right? We're always told, do not share these. Everybody can get a copy of these values. And what that's doing is it's allowing us to not put pressure on the GC, right? Like we get to leverage the stacks to their fullest extent because everybody can get a copy of this slice. What's in, the thing that's being shared underneath is what, let's say, necessarily has to be in the heap, just that. And all these little objects that we need to pass values around across these program boundaries, we get to leverage the stack, right? Because there's going to be two areas where we're going to want to focus around performance. One will be, I think, around data-oriented design and are we being sympathetic with the hardware and the caching systems? Are we working with data the best way we can? And then the other side is going to be, can we reduce pressure on the, on the garbage collector so it doesn't have to run as much, right? And these are two areas um, where I think we can focus just day one around performance when we're not getting enough of it. But I, I tell everybody in my classes all the time, I go, don't become paralyzed by all this stuff. You, you have to get whatever it is you're working on working first. And then you can profile and, and measure what's working. The, the, the profiling tooling is amazing, right? You can see the low-hanging fruit and then look at where you can spend real time. Where does your time need to be? And then these things kick in to help you understand how can I get some better performance here? Am I not being sympathetic with the caching system? Am I not being sympathetic with the operating system? Am I not being sympathetic with the garbage collector? Because I'm just allocating too much stuff here where, when I don't need to. How about the data-oriented design? I mean, I understand we don't want to maximize performance ahead of time before you know what you need what you need to optimize and even where you need to optimize how about the concept of data oriented design i can totally see you designing your software in a way that is not data oriented and still make it work and you might or might not have performance issues but let's say you do you know you want to change things around it seems to me if you didn't start out thinking about data oriented uh, the, the, that way of doing it, the changes will be so great. Um, the redoing will be so great versus if you had started out thinking in that way. And should we be doing that? Not so much in terms of let's try to optimize performance uh, too early, but is there are there payoffs of starting out with a data oriented design that that go beyond performance, maybe just code readability, uh, maintainability, that kind of thing? So Go is an object-oriented programming language, but I don't want people writing object-oriented programs in Go, and I think that's the line. I think if you're writing object-oriented software, you're not thinking about the data first. You're thinking about all of those relationships and, and, and object-oriented programming designs tend to create link lists at the end of the day. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're, to me, not sympathetic with the way the hardware works today. And so for me, this is about separating where you can the data that you're working on and then the, the behavior that's, that's going against that data. And I'm a big fan of functions. I love functions. One of the things that was so great when I got back, when I got into Go, was I had my functions back. Not everything had to be a method on a class. Uh, and I think functions can also help reduce a huge amount of your code when you're using them in a sense where here's my state and here's some behavior. I mean, methods play a huge role in Go. I'm not saying that you're not going to have methods. Um, but for me, it's about not thinking about architecting things in terms of an object-oriented designer pattern, but really thinking about this is the data, these, these are the manipulations, this is the input, this is the output, and how do I do that with the least amount of code? And now the data-oriented design uh, concept came from the game programming world, I, I believe. Yes. So, and a lot of their problems were, were similar, right? They needed things to happen fast because they need high frame rates. So they tried to start organizing their code in a manner um, so that their so that the data that they were working with was spatially located. So you know they they grouped the data they worked with commonly together to pass around versus um, working with objects. Yes, right. They have to do n number of things in x amount of time, and and time is not changing, right? So they have to make that happen. And so yeah, they they started to learn that if they had to be even more sympathetic 
um, than anyone else. But I think the slice, the idea of being able to leverage the slice as much as possible when it is practical and when it is reasonable is giving you a lot of this without you even realizing it. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about Go is that Go has given us the things that we need and it's pushing us towards these things by saying, well, I'm not going to give you any other data structure. I'm giving you maps and I'm giving you slices. And even maps are leveraging contiguous memory underneath. And then with all the reference type values, if we're not sharing them, we're passing them around, you know, everybody gets a copy. You're just getting these things. But yeah, I think I heard the term first from Mike Acton on a talk from 2014, where he goes into lower level detail than some of it I can't even understand about how he's leveraging data or in design um, in that gaming systems that he's building. So when we were researching the show, I came up, or I found the term false sharing. How does that fit into this whole picture? Yeah, so now we're getting really deep inside the, the hardware a little bit. But the idea is that because every core is going to be loaded with cache lines, if you have, let's say, two threads, one each running on a different core, working with the same data that happens to be on the same cache line, you now technically have two copies of that data one in the cache for core one and one in the cache for core two. And so um, you don't really have, let's say, and even if each thread is working with a different byte on each cache line, you don't have a concurrency issue there, right? You don't have a data race issue. But you do have a situation where the same data is now duplicated inside of a cache for two different cores. Now, the false sharing comes in because of that. It's false sharing. You don't really, from your perspective, you're not really sharing data. But from the hardware perspective, this data is being shared. The problem with false sharing doesn't come from reading, because if you're reading data, I mean, it's, it's when that data gets mutated, because as soon as one thread on one core mutates any data in that cache line, all other copies of that cache line in all other cores now have to be considered dirty. And when that other thread goes to do something on that cache line, its own copy of the cache line, and it's dirty, you now have to wait for a new version of the cache line to come in. And so that can create performance problems. Uh, an example that Scott Myers uses is that somebody's created a global array of counters so all of these counters, let's say, you know, all of these, let's say there's 16 counters all on the same cache line, and you launch 16 threads, each thread getting its own index of, uh, of a counter on this cache line, and all 16 threads getting their own core. You now have 16 copies of this cache line of these counters in every single core. And every time one thread writes increments its counter, all other 15 other caches now have to be marked as dirty. And you're chugging through memory because every thread that does a plus plus on their counter is causing every other thread now to have to wait for their copy of the cache line to get updated. So that's really what fault sharing is all about. So an example of that would be if you had a single backing array holding all of your counters. Yep. So. And, and we see stuff like this all the time, right? So like in your package, if you had a publicly exported array or slice for that matter, that just isn't, um, isn't appended to, well, even when it is appended to, but for example, you have an array of, you know, eight, eight byte integers that you're using as counters. So your example would be if each one of the threads using those were scheduled onto different CPUs, um, or cores, um, that incrementing any one of those would cause all of the caches to be blown out for that particular cache line. That's right. Because from your perspective, you're not caching, but from the hardware perspective, you are because every core has a unique, has its own copy of that same exact cache line. So, and I guess this kind of echoes back to your um, whole data oriented design, right? Because if you were, if you were keeping all the data locally, um, that you're working with, they wouldn't be grouped together somewhere else, right? Because the counters don't make sense together. They make sense so in their the, individual. So points. the solution to that is since every Go routine stack and the stack frame in that particular case for any Go routine is going to be on its own unique cache line, 
The solution to something like that would be to perform your counters on a local variable that would be on your cache for each, say, thread or go, you know, for each thread in that case. And therefore, every time each thread performs a plus plus, it's on a unique cache line. And at the end of that algorithm, you might perform one last write to the global. Um, and that's not going to hurt you. That's a, that's a one time boom, 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 boom. And so, right, so data locality, when we're talking about not just reading, but writing can also add a, a huge help in terms of being sympathetic with the way the caching system works. So if you had to pick just a couple takeaways for everyone, things to, to be cognizant of when developing, to, be, to start at least the journey of being more sympathetic to the hardware, uh, what would those be? I tell everyone, if they're not sure how to do something, ask the question around what is the most idiomatic way to do this in Go? Because many of those answers are already tuned to being sympathetic with the operating system or the hardware. The next thing I tell people is if you're working with data, try to work with slices of values as your initial load of data. You can share different elements of those slices, but the core data you're working with, we try to keep it as contiguous as possible. It's not going to be perfect because you're going to have strings and you're going to have reference types that will have pointers to things. But the compiler is your tool. It's going to do its best if we work with it to, to help us there. And try to think about if you're working with very large sets of data, what are the working sets that you might be working with at any given time? Try to keep that together um, and really try to avoid when you can and when it's practical, things like linked lists that are not going to really help you create predictable access patterns. There are times where whatever you're doing, the algorithms you're trying to build are not they're, they're just not going to be practical for arrays and, and linear traversals and things. That is what it is. But I think a lot of times you can lay that data out in a way and work with it in a way where, where you can gain these um, sympathies and still implement the algorithms that you're trying to implement. So what about laying out your data at a lower level? Um, I, I know when we talked about this a few months ago, when you came to visit us in Tampa, you talked about uh, the size of the structs and, and keeping them within word boundaries. Um, how does that affect processing speed? I'm not really sure. If I said that, I'm not sh The struct, if it's data, right? So to me, when I look at a struct, I look at it in two different ways. What I'll ask is, does this struct represent like pure data or is it a struct that's going to be some sort of concept like a pool of Go routines? I'm creating a pool of Go routines. I'm going to create multiple instances of this thing. It's managing Go or changes, let me do work. That's, that's one thing, right? But if the struct is going to be pure data, then the size of that struct is what it needs to be, whether it's 4K or 24 bytes, it is what it is. But what I'm looking at then is the concept of, of padding, right? If it's pure data where I'm gonna create 100 thousands of these structs and even lay them out contiguously in memory, I don't wanna lay the fields out in such a way where I'm going to get extra padding bytes in between that's going to cause me now to have to use more memory than I need to. But that's only when the struct, in my, in, in my view, the struct is really pure data. Other than that, I want to lay fields out in a struct that makes sense organizationally to what that struct is doing. So, uh, yeah, so sorry. I was just going to say, so one of the things I think might come into play there if you look at structs is if the struct is large enough where it doesn't all fit in a cache line, right? If you're using if you're using properties at the top of it and at the bottom of it, you could keep blowing out the cache line as you're just doing typical work. So I think sometimes it might come into play to organize your struct in a manner so that the things that are often used together are grouped together to ensure that they align properly. But I mean this gets into like going in depth into performance optimizations and you know Sometimes it's a little too far, right? It, that could be a level of micro-optimization. If these structs, let's say they do span over 64 bytes, they're still being laid out across two cache lines, right? And the next one might be laying into the next one. So you still might see the same sympathies anyway. Um, if you start mutating these things, right, then we go back to the fault sharing issues. And, you know, the hardware today is designed to copy, copy data really, really fast too. And so I, I tell people, don't panic because you think you've got a, uh, a struct that's too large 
to copy and now we're just going to start sharing it everywhere right like until you performance until you do some performance profiling you don't you don't really know so i rather the code be really reasonable around what we're trying to solve and not start thinking about performance as you're writing the code. We can always go and performance and profile it later. And we just might decide that, you know what? Yeah, this was too large to make copies of based on how we're using it. And it was better performing and sharing this um, across these program boundaries. What are some easy things to do, some easy rule of thumbs that can help people achieve this data-oriented design, thinking about grouping data that you're going to use together in the same place how how do you when you start out a, a program how do you think about these things I, but I, I really believe that every problem we solve is a data problem it's some data manipulation and so the very first thing i'm doing on projects is i'm asking what is the data that we're working with what is my input and what is it we're trying to achieve where, where are we trying to get to right here's my input Here's my output. And then we can start thinking about how we're going to get from, from here to there. And sometimes these are really complex problems, right? We've got to break them down into really, really small, obtainable, smaller data transformation problems. And that's, for me, when I start thinking about what does this data look like? Is some of this pure data, is some of this more constructs around how we want to do the manipulations? And then things that like Eric and Brian were already saying, well, we know that this is going to go across maybe multiple cache lines this is a pretty large data. Can we group the working sets together? These types of things. Um, I don't get completely paralyzed over it because we have to solve the problem. If you don't get something to work, you can't apply almost, you can't do any of this. You got to get something to work first. But I think what's brilliant is Go is pushing us in the direction to do things fairly right the first time if we follow the idioms, if we work with slices of values, if we're, we're doing things the way that as a community over the last few years, we've been, we've been directing people to do. So do you have any resources for us to kind of go out and start exploring these concepts? Oh uh, yeah, on the, on the Go Training um, GitHub repo under Arden Labs slash Go Training, I actually have a folder in there called Reading. And I've got a ton of links that I've kind of pulled out for people to, to read. And there's a whole section there around CPU caches and the Linux operating system and how the scheduler works and things like that. I mean, throughout the training material for each section, there's a ton of links and resources to learn more. So everything that I know is, comes from these videos and articles, and I'm always rereading them as well because there's so much air. It takes me sometimes a couple of months to absorb some stuff, and then I'll go back and read it again and and get more. So yeah, it's all out there. And I've tried to create a, a, a good collection of this, this stuff. And it's all there in the training repo. All right, I have a, a little bit of a change of a subject. Um, there's a grassroots movement going around. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. But there are several people that are talking about cosplaying as you this year at GopherCon. Did, did you know about this? Uh, could you give them some advice on maybe where to find the hat? <laughs> I say that again, they want the hat. <laughs> they're, they're looking to dress up as you this year at GopherCon. Uh, several people have mentioned ah. it. <laughs> that where, is where? too expensive to be playing right. that game. <laughs> I, I'm going to put this out there. Free beer for anybody who comes dressed as Bill Kennedy. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I, I will Free pick drink up tickets tab. all night. <laughs> uh, I, I will even steal the real hat and give it to you. <laughs> if that's all you're missing. Uh, oh, that's priceless. So we know you're a busy guy, Bill. Uh, you've got workshops going on at GopherCon. You've got the book going on. Is there anything you want to tell us about uh, any of those things that you've got going on other than your training? I, the, the, the thing, I mean, the trainings are always really exciting. And I'm really excited to be doing a Nats workshop on the, on the third day of go for con. But I think one of the things I'm really excited about right now is um, Carlisi and I, um, through GoBridge, we started the remote meetup platform. And we're putting a, uh, an all-star lineup of speakers together right now that will start speaking um, in June and July. And it's, it's going to be awesome because it doesn't matter where you live, everybody's going to be able to come together. And, and the platform, the big mark, uh, market platform is 
uh, really amazing in terms of being able to have collaboration. Um, but I, the real goal for us here is not for GoBridge to have a remote meetup, but, but for anybody, no matter where they live, to be able to start their own meetup, to be able to find their speakers of the things that they're interested in and, and have a meetup, even if they're the only person that lives in this small town or remote area of the world. Start a meetup, find people who have similar interests, find your own speakers and, and, and start to meet. You know, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can see another 10 or 15 go meetups by the end of the year, all being driven around this idea of a remote meetup. That's a neat idea. Yeah, Brian and I uh, commonly don't make it out to the Tampa one. I mean, time gets the better of you. So, Right. I, I know so many people that come to me and they, they, they get, even me, when I'm in Miami and San Francisco's holding a meetup with people that I want to hear and I can't get out there, it's, you know, it, it can be depressing sometimes. But what, what's great about this is, is you're going to be able to really start your own meetup and speakers from all around the world can come in. And you don't have to feel like you're missing out. And I love the Go community, right? I mean, you can reach out. Anybody can reach out to Brian and say, Brian, will you give me a, can you, can, you would talk for a meetup? And Brian's going to say yes. He will say yes. I will say yes. So many you're people. yes on his behalf. <laughs> I can't get Eric to say yes, but we're going to get Eric to say yes one day too. One day. <laughs> Bill, do you want to mention some of the people that have already agreed to do a, a, a meetup? Yeah, so we have, um, I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right, Buto, Tammy Buto from Dropbox, who's scheduled to talk. I haven't published this yet. Um, Kelsey Hightower has agreed to give a talk too. Um, so I'll be publishing um, that very soon on the days that are there. And we've reached out to a few more people. I haven't gotten confirmations yet. So hopefully they're going to be coming in soon and we'll publish that on our meetup page and um, you know, we'll tweet that out. And we're really, really excited about that. That's really awesome. Yes, and, and I suggest to people to sign up. There is a limit of 100 attendees. So when you see um, the, the tweet going out, just go and sign up so you don't be left out. And I have to say, um, Compose.io is sponsoring our Plus account that gives us the 100 people. So we're really excited that they stepped up and um, they're supporting the Go community. Absolutely. That's great. They're also GopherCon sponsors, so double props to them. Yeah, so that's what I'm kind of focusing on now um, with what little time I have trying to get enough speakers set up and really show people the power of the platform so others will come in and start their own meetups. At the end of the day, that's what I would love to see. I don't think you're quite busy enough, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you travel or anything. I mean, nah. Well, you know, I have a lot of time on planes. <laughs> uh, so Can't sleep on them. Oh, I can't. I can't sleep in cars. I can't sleep on planes. I, I just, in general, I can't sleep, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so typically, like, I, I guess we're running out of time here, but uh, typically the way we close out of uh, the shows is we like to thank open source projects that have kind of made our lives better and easier just to show appreciation. So we'll quickly go around the virtual room here. And everybody can give a quick shout out, Bill, if you've got one handy, you're welcome to join. The one that I've been working on, um, because I, I do some work on the Coral project, which is an open source project, is Anvil IO, which is providing um, authentication and authorization. It's all written in Node, um, but we've added some, some Ghost support on the client side, and, and it's a really cool platform. Awesome. Brian? So uh, one of the projects that I wanted to shout out this week was Go Validator. Uh, it's it, the link will be in the show notes, but if you've ever had to validate inbound data, uh, you know how painful it is to write that regex for email validation or credit card validations. Uh, this is a, uh, a project by Alex Saskovich that it collects all of the important validations that you might need to do for incoming data. And it's, it's just a treasure trove of, of good validations. You know, even if you're against dependencies this is one you want to have because they're very nicely organized list of things to validate your data excellent carlicia i want to give a shout out to joe Fitz fitzgerald uh, can pronounce it properly he is the one who does all of the go uh, packages for adam and he does an amazing job he has uh, go plus and uh, autocomplete go go 
Meta, Linter, and Tester Go, a bunch of packages. I use them all the time. He's amazing. He's frequently on the editor channel on Gopher Slack and very helpful. Love the things that he's doing for Adam. Thank you, Joe. I didn't even know there was an editor channel. These these channels pop up too fast. <laughs> it's like, wait, there's a channel for that? Some is there a barbecue channel? There is now. <laughs> there is a barbecue channel. There is. Yeah, that's a silly question. <laughs> so uh, this is funny. This is kind of sidelining here, but somebody made a comment about like needing a barbecue gopher. So we're like, we should totally see whether the Arden guys will create one for us. And there apparently already exists one. <laughs> There's already a gopher like standing at a grill or what I forget what yeah, it looks like he's, now. He's standing at a grill. He's got a cowboy hat on. He's got an apron and he's got the barbecue tongs. And I can tell you that the shirts have already been ordered. Where's mine? <laughs> it's, on, it's in the mail, Eric. Sweet. Uh, so for me, I'm going to thank HashiCorp. Uh, particularly, I'm using their LRU cash this week um, that they have available. But. Uh, many times before, Brian to you know, Vagrant, Vault, uh, Console, just so many other tools are useful. So I'm just going to bling at least say HashiCorp. So we encourage everybody else to thank their favorite open source projects through uh, Twitter or any other social media. Um, reaching out is often just a good thing, as Brian spoke to in I think it was episode one. Um, you know, just getting that that comment from people makes it. All the difference sometimes so with that said i think we are out of time unfortunately but it has been quite a fun episode and uh we definitely want to thank bill for coming on the show with us and i'm i know myself i'm going to be digging through more of the stuff he's got in the training material because i've got tons of free time too right all of us <laughs> <laughs> exactly and thanks for having me on this was a lot of fun definitely want to thank bill or i'm sorry brian and carlicia for, for the panel. I think this has been one of my favorite episodes. Um, thank everybody who's listening. I think uh, Adam told us what there's like 25 plus people listening this week live. That's crazy. So yeah, it's great. It's growing. Yeah. So um, we also uh, released our first episode, which is both good and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> scary. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely scary. But you can get it. So GoTime FM will redirect to uh, ChangeLog site where our first episode is hosted. Well, the CMS is completed by popular demand. We have started releasing episodes uh, before the CMS is completed. So you'll find that there. And uh, probably within the next week, um, some more episodes will be dropping uh, for everybody who's uh, impatient. Um, I don't know whether the newsletter signup is on that site, but if it's not, it is there or will be here soon. Um, so keep checking back to the GoTime FM to, to sign back up. Uh, iTunes will drop, I think, in about a week and a half, uh, something like that, because they take forever to approve unless they tell us for some reason they don't like our show. <laughs> <laughs> not approved. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are on Twitter at GoTime FM. Um, when you are listening live, uh, GoTime FM channel on Slack. You can also socialize with us. And did I miss anything? Did we, did we get it all? No, it was a busy episode. All right. Awesome. So with that, uh, thanks everybody for being on the show. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.